period. Right? Now here is a pulsar uh, which is a part of a binary system. This is one of the millisecond pulsar because its pulse period uh, is only about 8 kids in milliseconds. Now as it happens you can measure the pulse period extremely accurately. And now you see how much is this pulse period measured. Uh, this is the famous millisecond pulsar, 1.6 millisecond period. But you see that this is 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. Right? So this is not like dividing uh, 1 by 3. You can go 0 0.33333 3 to infinity. This is actually shows you how accurately the spin period has been measured. Right? Up to the 15th place of decimal. You can also, that spin period which is known so accurately also changes. And it changes only in the 19th place of decimal. Uh, per second. So the question is, how do I build clocks which allow me to measure the period so accurately? And is it possible that the pulsar itself uh, can become a more accurate clock? So ac accurate clocks in India are maintained by the National Physical Laboratory in Delhi and other such laboratories in the world. Now people who maintain these terrestrial clocks are very fond of them and they say that they are the most accurate in the world. But astronomers like to say that it is the pulsar clocks which are most accurate. So here is the here is a measure of accuracy and here is the integration time. Now you see that millisecond pulsars <coughs> are the lower you are the more accurate you are. And you see that millisecond pulsars here um, are um, <coughs> will, will over the course of time become more accurate than terrestrial clocks. Right? So this is the direct input from astronomy into terrestrial clocks. Now I show you just two pictures of uh, radio telescopes. I told you about optical telescopes. I told you about radio te X-ray telescopes. Now this is the radio telescope which is known as the giant meter wave radio telescope with GMRT which you might have heard of in Narayangao. And, uh, now here's another picture of the same telescope and this is the picture uh, it is not a picture, I'm going to show you a picture of the biggest telescope which is a radio telescope of the next decade which is known as the square kilometer array now half of this will be in South Africa and half of it will be in Australia but Indian astronomers particularly those belonging to the National Center for Radio Astrophysics are making important contributions for it so you see that here is, uh, these are again, uh, these, are now, these are simulated pictures, they are not real pictures. But these antennae are going to be, they are already getting built. It will be ready, part of it will be ready by 2020 and then later by 2024. And one of the big challenges will be, how do you process the vast amounts of data which are produced by this telescope. So I have taken you through a walk through technology which makes input into astronomy. And there are many things which I have not touched upon today. And I hope to be able to talk to some of you at least about that in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much sir for delivering such a wonderful lecture. I must say I am not a student of physics, but परंतु आपने जिस सुगमता, सरलता और सहजता से एवं बहुत ही दुर्लभ चित्रों के माध्यम से इसे प्रस्तुत किया, यह हम सब के लिए जो है बोधगम हो पाया। इसके लिए पुनः धन्यवाद। Now it is time for a question answer session. If somebody have some query, please. This side. There are going to be questions, is it? Yeah. Good evening, sir. So last year, ISRO launched a range of satellites and it also launched a software system called NAVIC. So how does it compare to GPS and GLOMAS and uh, G such systems of other countries and which is better? Yeah, <coughs> that's a very good question. It is uh, the... 
the systems which are there with the US for example or the Galileo system which Europe has that provides you full coverage of the entire earth uh, but our satellite system does not provide that because we have got a limited number of satellites and we can see only a part of the earth around India so maybe in the future we'll have full coverage but otherwise technically it's as accurate as the other systems So my question is, can you explain to me about the neutron stars? Um, unfortunately, there is no time at the present time. Uh, at, uh, right now, um, I can, maybe somebody will cover that during your camp. Uh, Professor Pushpa Khare is going to be talking, maybe she will say a little. Are you a part of the INSPIRE camp? Yes, sir. Are you in the INSPIRE camp? Yes, sir. Okay, then you will hear from her about it. So why the so second question is why the pulsars have the greater inertia? No, the neutron stars have greater inertia. Uh, that is because they are so massive and they are rotating very rapidly. So but then the other stars will also have the greater inertia. Uh, yeah, they have, but the other stars are much bigger, and they are not they are not rotating so rapidly. The rapid rotation is most important. Oh, thank you, sir. Hello. Good evening, sir. I am Jitesh from GMSS Nandi. Sir, can you tell me what are photons? What does it actually mean? Photons? I, I don't think I will tell you what are photons because other people will be covering it. I would like to answer a few questions specifically on the subject of my lecture today. Okay, that will be done at another time. Okay, because other I am leaving my subject. So, does anybody have questions on what I gave? Yes, please. Sir, what is the full form of X-ray? X-ray is X-ray. Okay, it means that X doesn't stand for uh, Zanadu or something like that. Okay, because uh, when, when these X-rays were first accidentally discovered, the world did not know what kind of radiation it is. So they just called it an X-ray. So, sir, there is nothing a mystery in that name? No, no, there is nothing mysterious about the name. Yes. Okay, uh, so, sir, uh, so how does it actually penetrate into a body? It, it penetrates into a body because you see that at X-rays have high energy. Each photon of the X-ray has got high energy. And it interacts less with the matter that passes through. And therefore it can penetrate deeper into the matter. Hmm. Okay? Thank you, sir. Sir, you just mentioned in your lecture mirror black material. So I wanted to ask you what a mirror black material is and how is it different from a normal mirror? No, what did I... I can't hear because of the echo. Can somebody tell me what did he say? Sir, you just uh, mentioned mirror black material. Oh, mirror blank. Uh, what's I a mirror blank? Ask, okay. How Actually, is it different? Yeah, you see a mirror blank uh, is just a piece of glass. You see a mirror consists of two parts. Actually, one is a piece of glass which can be very accurately shaped. But that will not reflect light. Because if you have got window glass, it doesn't reflect light. So you put a thin coating of silver on top of it and that is what reflects the light. So the mirror, before it is polished into the correct shape and where the coating is applied, is known as a mirror blank. It is not different from a normal mirror. Before the mirror is made, the glass is known as a blank. Once you polish it and you put silver on it, then it is known as a mirror. Okay? So, uh, yeah. So, what is the current ongoing uh, mission uh, regarding telescopes around the world? Major. What is current what? So, what is the most largest uh, uh, project going on uh, right now? The 30 meter telescope that I mentioned now. That is the largest, that is the second largest optical telescope. The largest is known as ELT, Extremely Large Telescope. So That's about a 40 meter diameter. So where is it located? Uh, both will be, uh, the, the ELT will be located in Chile. The TMT is to be located on Hawaii, but there may be some change in that plan. Okay? No? 
Okay, thank you very much. Sir, sir, what is the role of Indian Neutrino Observatory? Pardon me? Indian Neutrino Observatory. Oh, Indian uh, Neutrino Observatory. Yes, you see that all the cosmic sources, they emit neutrinos also. Um, and it is very difficult to detect the neutrinos. Just like I said, it's very difficult to detect gravitational waves. Neutrinos are weakly interacting particles and very difficult to detect them. But the idea in the neutrino observatory is to build a detector, very large detector inside a mountain in which you can trap these neutrinos and study them. Thank you, sir. Okay, shall I stop now? Thank you very much. May I now request our Honorable Vice Chancellor to come over the dais, shawl and sleeveful, and present a memento. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Now I request uh, Dr. Kalul K. Ghosh to come upon the dais and do the formality of delivering vote of thanks. Uh, please, sir. Vice Chancellor, sir, respected Professor Ajit Kimbhavi and distinguished guest and my dear young students, I deem it a great pleasure and honor to propose vote of thanks for this auspicious occasion that is the first Dr. A.P.J. Abdul Kalam Memorial Lecture organized by Public Outreach System, Pandit Ravi Shankar Shukla University. I have no words to express my deep sense of gratitude to Professor Kembhavi for accepting our invitation for this first memorial lecture. I am really grateful to you, sir. On behalf of Public Outreach System and Pandit Ravi Shankar University, I must thankful to all the distinguished guests and students for attending this important program. I am grateful to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor S.K. Pandey, for giving full support for this program and particularly Mr. K.K. Chandrakarji for all these logistic activities. So lastly, I thank all the young students for this program. Now I invite all of you for a cup of tea. Thank you very much. And I am the Pradhan Mantri Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru ki pangtiya jo mujhe yaad aari hai, usse uddhat karte hoi karikram ki samapti ki goshna karungi. I should like you to remember that of your homage is not what you say about him, but the way you live, the way you glow, and the way you act upon this message. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Good evening once again to all of you. Good evening to respected dignitaries. For post tea session, we have one more uh, lecture with us. And to honor us with her presence, we have Dr. Namrata Gundia from Department of Mechanical Engineering, Indian Institute of Science. For her floral welcome, I humbly request uh, Professor Sanjay Tiwari, Head of Department, School of Studies in Electronics, to please present a bouquet of flowers. Please, sir, do the honors. I 
I also request Professor Tiwari to please come over the dais to throw some light on illustrious career of Professor Gundia. I welcome you all in this 14th DST Inspire Camp and in this last session. And I thank Professor Kallol Ghosh for giving me this opportunity to moderate this session. And I am very happy to introduce the speaker of this session, Dr. Namrata Gundia. Actually, Dr. Namrata Kundia, as Dr. Kalul Ghosh said to you, his, she obtained his MSc degree in physics from the University of Pune in the year 1994. She also received then Master of Science from Me in Mechanical Engineering, MS in Mechanical Engineering in 2000 from the University of California, Berkeley. And then she continued her work uh, for PhD in Mechanical Engineering from the same university, University of California, Berkeley. You all might know this University of California, Berkeley. It is most of the, uh, best, one of the best university of our world. Yeah, of the world yeah. uh, the research interest of Dr. Namrata Lies, uh, mainly lie in the broad areas of tissue biomechanics, cell mechanobiology, biomaterials, and biomimetics. She is recipient of prestigious Ramanujam Fellow, Ramanujam Fellowship. She got this fellowship, she worked a lot in this fellowship, and she, is, she got the prestigious internationally recognized International Tipper Medal for in recognition of her research work and she is editor, editor of so many journals just like biomechanics and modeling in microbiology and she has published her papers in the journals of national and international repute. She is going to deliver a talk today advancing the edge role of mechanics in cell migration. This is a very very important topic actually I, I think she is expert of not only biology, uh, just mechanics, as well as physics also. So I welcome Dr. Namrata to please come and deliver her talk. Dr. Namrata. Thank you all. Um, I'd like to especially thank Dr. Ghosh, Dr. Tiwari. Um, it's especially a pleasure to be here because long ago I used to be a student of physics and Professor Nadlikar um, was one of my teachers. I spent three months in Ayuka uh, very long ago, and it's a privilege to share the stage with him. So thank you very much for inviting me and for having me here. Um, so as everyone has said, what I do is not something you might have thought of earlier, but hopefully by the end of today's lecture, you'll be convinced that there is a place for someone like me who's, who has broad level of interest spanning from mechanics to biology. Okay? So since there is confusion of my um, background also, I thought what I'm going to do is try and tell you a little bit of how I came to be who I am today. So um, I started with a bachelor's and master's in physics. Um, I was at the Indian Institute of Science for a PhD program. I spent two years there, but like most girls do, I got married and I quit my program and I moved to the US. I then applied and got into the University of California, Berkeley. But at this time, I realized that my true interest lie in understanding the nature around us. I was interested in rubbers and rubber proteins and how do they work in our bodies. So I decided to approach someone who worked on these questions. and. That's how I changed to working in mechanics and biology. So soon after, while I was a graduate student, I had my first child. Um, and I was, uh, my husband was a postdoc by then. Then I did a postdoc when I worked with clinicians. I worked with doctors because I thought as an engineer, one needs to understand what is the kind of problems doctors face and how can we look at this interface between biology, medicine, and physics, or mechanics. So I worked with a bunch of clinicians there, which was a very exciting experience for me. My second son, Advait, was also born when I was a postdoc. I then decided to return to India. Again, I took a year off um, during this time. I have taken a lot of uh, off time, uh, but 
I think it was done on my, my own uh, judgment. I then applied for a job and I got jobs wherever I applied, which is a good thing for those of us who want to take breaks in our life, right? I'm especially speaking to the young women over here. Uh, uh, most of you will come to this bridge at one time or another. So if you are sufficiently sure that research is what you want to do, then make sure you find a nice partner who can support you and go after it. <laughs> that would be my advice to you. So I have been at the Indian Institute of Science uh, for the past about eight years, and I'm now an associate professor there. Um, so at the heart of what I do is I'm interested in everything related to the circulatory system. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's the heart, which is shown over here. I'm interested in how the blood flows through the aorta. Remember, it is blood flowing through curved tubes, which makes it very exciting. I'm also interested in the tissues which constitute the aorta. If you think about your skin, you can stretch it a lot. Steel cannot stretch this much. It's considered like it has yielded, right? So I started with an interest in what is called nonlinear mechanics, um, which is a lot of tensor calculus, tensor algebra, elasticity. I apply it to biological systems. Um, I spent a lot of time when I was a graduate student trying to understand these systems. What I realized when I moved to India was I did not have a handle on how the cells, which are part of this matrix, how they respond to mechanical loads. So I spent my time building a program which is looking at mechanobiology, okay, which means mechanics applied to biology, in this case, cells. What we also do is we work in what is broadly called tissue engineering, where we work with material scientists to design and make new materials, which we can use, hopefully, as replacement for various uh, tissues in our body which have gotten diseased and which will fail. So that's pretty much my entire research program. Okay? Now hopefully that makes sense to you. But what is so difficult about nonlinear elasticity? So what I'm showing you is a cartoon, okay? A cartoon representation of how stress is related to strain. This is not the stress and strain you feel before an exam comes. Okay? These are the stresses which is nothing else but force per unit area, okay? Which is again not a scalar parameter, it's a tensorial quantity. Right now I'm just showing a cartoon. I'm looking at how stresses and strains are plotted. And if you remember your Hooke's law, okay, what you see is that for a nice low carbon steel, where you see it increase linearly, and the slope of this graph is nothing else but Hooke's law, right? which is either called F equals Kx or sigma equals E epsilon, right? Um, most material, low carbon steels have this little fluctuation when they have yielded and then they will fail. Ceramics, on the other hand, have a very sharp graph and they rupture. Uh, if you look at something like a rubber-like material, you'll see that the strains that they undergo is a lot. Just take a rubber band and try and pull it. If I were to construct a stress strain graph, you start seeing that it's highly nonlinear. So, where would I call my modulus? Or where is the slope that I will drop? It clearly depends on the strain which I define, and I can define the slope at that point. Uh, in contrast, if you look at soft tissues, you have a J shaped curve, but not only is it J shaped curve, you have two different responses depending on whether I'm pulling it in one direction or the other. So what I have now done is I not only have, a, here you had a very simple isotropic response, which means you get the same property any direction that you pull. That's not true in most biological tissues, which makes it more exciting for us. Uh, so it's nonlinear, it's anisotropic, and we want one function which can ultimately tell us what is stress and strain, and that relationship is called a constitutive equation. Okay? Um, so to tell you, most of you have heard about this development of mechanics. So what I want to try and convince you is that 
biomechanics or mechanobiology is not a new science. Okay? If you look at how the development of mechanics happened, it started with my favorites, which I'm showing here. First of all, Aristotle, who is considered uh, father of logic, and he was a student of Plato, who was a student of Socrates. Galileo Galilei, as Professor Narlikar mentioned earlier, he started with the heliocentric theory. He ran into a lot of trouble uh, with that. So actually he was asked to uh, redact some of the things he said, that the earth was not at the center, uh, and in fact it was uh, the sun. So he said, and yet it moves, right? That is what he is supposed to have mentioned. But, uh, he worked on the strength of materials, how strong things are. In fact, he was very interested in applying some of these ideas of mechanics of materials to understand bone, because he thought of bones as uh, columns on which you put load. Um, of course, Hook, he's considered the father of um, the elasticity theory. Newton, none of us can forget who Newton was. So, now if you look for how did, was, uh, were humans interested in thinking about biology, it should not come as a surprise to us. Um, so after, Gal so there was Galileo Galilei who looked at bones, and this was in the Renaissance time, okay? Renaissance time, uh, scientists pretty much did everything they were interested in, right? This was also around the same time when Da Vinci, you would have seen this very famous picture, if most of you have read all those Da Vinci code and all that stuff that you would have seen. What Da Vinci is also famous for is, I think of him as the first scientist who studied fracture. How do materials fail? And he had this very clever setup. Okay, what he did was, he was looking at how strong wires of steel were. So what he did was, he took a long length of wire and he put uh, a little hopper from which he dropped, uh, he dropped some sand periodically and he just measured how much weight of sand could that little um, th that, uh, steel um, wire take. What he next did was he kept cutting that wire shorter and shorter. And he asked the question, should you get it lower and lower? But lo and behold, he realized that the smaller things are, uh, they could undergo, they could withstand a lot more load before they failed. Then we got to understand that metals have flaws inside. All materials have flaws inside. So he's thought of as the father of fracture mechanics. Uh, another one of my favorites is Harvey. He was actually a physician, but he showed that the human heart is actually a pump. In fact, if you look at how uh, we apply mechanics to the heart, which we can do, you will see similar equations like pressure versus volume, which you would have studied for engines. Okay? So what really is biomechanics? It's probably one of the first times you're hearing this. Um, Descartes, who is also very important because we have the Cartesian system, which is named after, Des after him. Descartes was one of the first people who had this thought that is the brain, is there a difference between mind and, um, and uh, the brain? So can you distinguish the two? And can we think of man as a machine, right? Can we apply mechanics to study various principles? The others were also Borelli, who looked at how muscles can generate forces, uh, which we could measure. But remember, a lot of this happened during Renaissance time. And soon what happened was, physics became the purview of physicists. Biologists went and did their biology. No one talked to each other, right? Until about 1917 which was when there was a classic work done by a person called Darcy Thompson, who, whose book was called On Growth and Form. And he looked at these curved beams, and he looked at the loads of stress uh, through analysis, and he showed that it's very similar to how bone is laid out. Okay? So he said that bone seems to be present just where bone is required. It's not a rubber which is present there. It's a very strong material. So, how is it that we have the form which seems to fit so well to the function that that material is required? It was only after, after this that we started thinking about biological materials. Remember, biology is not as simple as metals, where a lot of us have started studying, right? So, 
first of all, the structure is complex. It's not as simple as your BCC and FCC. If you've not studied, you will study it at some point. Most of the biopolymers is la looks like this bowl of spaghetti or noodles, right? If you look closer at things like the skin, you have layered architecture. You have different components which go in and each layer is resisting the load that you're throwing on it. So you have something which is not isotropic, you have something which is not homogeneous, and you have something which is not linear, right? It makes it all fun to actually go and study what these things are like. When we think of modern biomechanics, we can't forget the contributions of uh, Professor Y.C. Fung, who is considered the father of modern biomechanics. He's quite old now. I understand he must be over 90. He must be about 93, 94. He, he is at the University of California, San Diego. He's still active. He does some research. And he did a lot of interesting things that we start giving him the name as the father of modern biomechanics. But most important, we had to have four important developments, the way I think about it. The first, we also had a lot of technological advances in computing. Remember, biology is not simple. One, like I've told you, you have nonlinear problems. The boundary conditions that you put on these are not simple. Geometries are complex. So uh, we need to use uh, computers to analyze these things. We also need microprocessor-based experiments that we can set up. Right? Um, again, numerical methods like finite element methods, computational fluid dynamics, we had to develop all of this, which has happened in the past 40 years or so. Most importantly, um, the field of biomechanics started in the United States because it was President Kennedy who first said, I'm going to put a man on the moon. That's what happened in the 60s, before most of you were born. Me too. So once he said, you're going to put a man in, on the moon, the question was, what happens to his bone in... Uh, when you have different gravity conditions. Uh, how, how does the body adapt to a different gravity situation? And that's when the United States started its interest in biomechanics. Now that we have sent uh, Chandrayaan and other missions, to, uh, we're thinking of sending to Mars, it's probably a very good time for you to be very interested in this field because if anything, it needs to grow. So most of what I do requires three different things. We need to understand what is the structure. We need to understand what is the composition. And finally, we need to be able to measure or quantify the properties of these very soft uh, materials. So hopefully I've convinced you by now that biomechanics is not new. Lots of people have done it for 400 years plus, right? And uh, it's a fun question. So with that, I'm going to start talking about what I thought I should discuss, uh, which is to look at the role of mechanics in cell migrations. Right? So before getting to that, I thought I'll start with telling you a little bit about the cell. Okay? The cell is a basic unit of life. And most of you would have had biology and would know in sufficient detail that most animal cells have a nucleus inside which you have the heredity matter which is enclosed inside. This is actually packed very differently inside the nucleus, okay? Uh, and it also responds to loads. Um, you also have other components like the endoplasmic reticulum and you have finally a plasma membrane. About 70% of the cell is water. It's a very soft material, right? So going back to the idea of form and function, what I'd like to ask in my lab is, how do cells maintain their shape? Okay? Why is it, are they like balloons which are filled with viscous liquid, like your holy balloon? Okay? Or are they solid? Uh, what are the mechanical properties of these different components? How does it not collapse? How does it keep its shape? Second question, how do cells move? Right? Uh, what are the different components of the cell which supports this movement? Third question, how does a cell interact with its mechanical environment? You know, if any of you have had a broken bone, 
uh, you'd have seen that the bone becomes very weak when it's inside the plaster cast, right? And your doctor will tell you don't lift one bite of water because it can break. Why is that? Because that bone, when not being used, is starting to break down in its composition. So it's not very strong. So what I'm trying to tell you is bone responds to its mechanical loads. So does an artery. Okay? These are structures which are constantly being loaded. It could be due to blood flow. It could be due to the extension and distension as the arterial wall expands and uh, contracts during the blood flow. Okay, so the last question is how do cells transport material? Okay, how is um, calcium being transported inside the cell? I know Professor Roop Malik is going to be here sometime and you're going to really enjoy his talk. So I will not talk about the last part and I'll focus my attention on the first three parts, uh, which is most of what my lab studies. So Mechanobiology okay, is mechanics applied to biology, in this case, a cell. Okay. If, you see this cut, if, if you see this picture here, this is a picture of a cell which has a nucleus shown in blue. It also has a bunch of red color which is outside and green color lines that you can see inside. These are actually structural proteins which are trying to keep the shape of the cell the way we want it to stay. So the cytoplasm is all the components of a cell which is not the nucleus. Okay? Um, it contain, contains actin which is located towards the end of the cell in red and microtubules which are actually hollow cylinders okay? and uh, they resist compressive loads. Okay? And then you have other components like the intermediate filaments. These are the main components of the cytoskeleton. But unlike steel, they undergo dynamic changes. And I'll try and convince you how that happens. So we first begin with actin. Actin is like uh, a thin steel cable. right? So if you see, uh, this picture is not very visible, but on my computer it looks good. What you see here is the blue nucleus, and you see this very nice red color actin on my computer screen. So the actin helps to maintain the shape of the cell and it generates motion. Okay? Uh, they're very tiny, uh, 7 nanometers in diameter and it is the tension bearing element of the cell. Uh, along with myosin, you have myosin which crawls on actin and you get muscles to contract. Right? So the minute you want to lift something, you lift it because this muscle needs to contract so my arm comes closer to me. And the way this contraction happens is you have actin which walks on myosin and the length changes. So it works along with motor proteins to cause contractions uh, which, the cells, uh, which allows the cells to move. Um, if you look at how actin works, it's, 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 it, it's actually two different protofilaments which are put together. Uh, you have these individual monomers, so like a polymer chain is built of small little blocks, each of which is repeated n times to make a very, very long chain. So think of a thread which you can cut into many, many parts. Okay? Each part is exactly the same, but you build it all back together. That's what this actin looks like. So if you look at uh, each of it has structure, right? Uh, it's a complex structure, but what we understand is that each of these binding requires some amount of energy which is produced. Based on the structure, we think of this as a barbed end, similar to an arrow, right? And this is the pointed end for actin. You keep adding actin in one side and you dissociate from the other. That's how you dynamically change. And to show this, I'll show you how this process happens with a video. Um, what you see here is how one end starts growing, it's getting dissociated, and it keeps building. This is how the actin keeps growing, and I'll play it one more time because it's so fun. Right? So this is how the pointed end is growing and the barbed end is getting dissociated. So 
a lot of physics goes into this process to understand how this process works okay because we need to consider the energetics of the reaction of how you build this whole thing and what causes it to break so to show you that actin is truly important in migration i wanted to show this cartoon because migration can actually be broken into several individual small steps and to show that what you see here is a cell it's got that blue nucleus again it's got that red color actin which is located at the boundary of the cell the cells make certain distinct locations to its substrate okay these distinct locations are shown in black now if i am a cell and i want to move forward what i need to do is one decide which direction i need to go two i have to make a protrusion in that specific direction okay once i make the protrusion i need to build on the actin which is present in that location and i do that through recruitment of all the actin from here all the way in the front through the process which i showed you earlier that's how you keep adding more and more actin once that is happening i need to make a connection in the forward direction but remember i'm not done because i'm still attached at the back unless and until i break my connections at the back i will not move forward which is what happens i the idea and finally i have to pull the rest of the cell con con uh, constituents through tension which is generated inside and push myself forward so that's the entire sequence of steps uh which shows how things move forward right so there's a lot of mechanics here if you haven't discovered it already if you look at the structure of this cell you will see very definite cable like uh structures which are present inside so the microtubules which are present and i told you that it's actually a hollow stick like structure except uh it's not it's completely hollow now hollow structures are very useful in nature if you've seen how bamboo trees are hollow right have you noticed bamboo trees are hollow you would have seen your bicycle fork is also hollow hollow structures are extremely good at reducing the bending stresses that you have okay and you can show this through very simple beam equations these ones actually bear compression inside the cell okay so these are structural elements of the cell and uh, they also form a highway through which you transport material and roop is going to show you some very fun things i hope on how material gets transported uh, motors work uh, through the microtubules now together when people looked at these two components of a cell it looks very much like tensegrity structures like bridges right when you see a bridge you'll see that there are solid steel sections which are connected with cables okay so the steel structures the cables serve as tension bearing elements and the solid structures work like in compression so it was donald ingber who is a professor in harvard he said why can't we apply these beam equations to study how cells behave and he said that let's apply this to cells which is shown here where he called them tensegrity structures so they bear both tension as well as compression now that i have told you this and you go outside and you look in your neighborhood you'll see a lot of structures which are constructed like this okay where you can build tall structures with just steel cables and very strong steel bars which are held into place okay we used the same theory like we did to understand cells but remember cells are not just what i showed on the inside they have connections with the outside world okay and the connections here everything inside is parts of the cell and everything outside is called the extracellular matrix this for us are structural proteins which give our tissue uh, structural rigidity okay so cells attach uh, through what are called adhesion sites to their outside environment okay and the outside tissue can get stretched okay when i discussed the stress and strain relationships the cells will not contribute as much 
to the modulus of that tissue. However, the cells can make the proteins which contribute to that mechanical property. So, uh, this part is uh, especially important in cases like arteries. Okay, and I'll show you one example of why, and if you look more closer, this is how complex those adhesion sites are, which is what biologists will study. Um, okay, the reason why I am interested is because cells constantly interact with their mechanical environment. Now to show you it is important, I wanted to show you a simulation of how blood flows inside a curved tube, which is over here which is like your aorta, but blood is moving really fast in this region as it exits the heart. It's typically about 1.2 meters per second. Okay? And if you are to understand a little bit of fluid dynamics, you'll know that all your Reynolds numbers is extremely high. What is also interesting is it is curved. So if I were to play this video, this is my student who has shown how flow structures evolve. If you look at these planes, you see very nice structures which form, okay? And these structures go from the side wall, they climb up, and then they collide and move out, okay? So this is how vortices or eddies form inside the blood. Any time we think of disturbed flows, you look outside from your airplane window the next time you sit in an airplane, and you'll see these kind of nice vortical structures uh, which are getting thrown out from the wing the next time. We can also run simulations because that was a visualization tool and this will help us quantify what are the kind of velocities and what are the kind of stresses. We care about these parameters because the cells which are present inside that tube are constantly being subjected to these kind of shears. Okay? What we also understand is diseases in arteries happen in regions where there is disturbed flow. Okay? So it is important that we relate that mechanics to how biology works. The reasons why I'm also interested in this problem is we discussed flow, but also we have the effect of stretching. Okay? The vessel is constantly being pulled out and in during the blood flow. If you look at this cartoon, this is actually a human aorta. Down here is the heart. Blood from the heart goes up and then it comes down. The reason I'm interested here is if you follow this part, there's a little bulge which is started here, similar to when you blow a balloon. This bulge grows until it ruptures. This is called an aneurysm. And Einstein died of an aneurysm located in his abdomen. Okay? It's a silent disease we don't understand how this thing balloons because arteries are not designed to become like balloons, right? But in certain cases, the arteries balloon out. So we are interested in following what are the events which contribute to this ballooning. What also happens is that a cell which is present inside this arterial wall here is constantly being stretched and you have flows present. As a result, you have what is called a homeostasis which is being maintained. Homeostasis means a constant level of something. In this case, it, it is a certain constant level of stretch that the cell is being exposed to. We think that this stretch is a very crucial parameter for a cell because it tells the cell what protein to make or what protein to break down. When you change the homeostasis is when disease happens. That is our working hypothesis, right? So, as you see here, how do we grow? When we are young children, we add a lot of material as we grow. As we grow old, we start having disease. Each of this is contributing to a certain aspect of how things grow and change. But one is a positive way and one is a negative way. But our connection to mechanics is through this idea of homeostasis. The point being, I have to have a handle of how I will expose my cells to different amount of mechanical loading. And then I need to go and find how that cell has behaved in response to load. So, what I've, so this was the introduction I had so far in trying to tell you that mechanics 
and biology needs to be married together because it can teach us a lot about how we grow. It can also teach us a lot about how diseases happen uh, in certain cases, diseases like cancer. So to tell you that, I thought I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how cells adhere, how much forces do they exert when they adhere, and how do they walk or migrate. So that's going to be the first part of what I do. Now to give you an example of where you have cells migrating inside the body, the first common thing you see is that of blood cells, right? That's the most common way how if you have a cut, your, uh, your body is exposed to bacteria and suddenly you'll have an, a flooding of your uh, white blood cells. So what you're going to see in this video, it's extremely old, uh, it's a 1950s video, you'll see a neutrophil which is chasing a bacteria. And I just want you to look at this for a little while. That's your bacteria, uh, sorry, uh, that's your white blood cell, neutrophil, and these are all the little bacterial particles. If you look carefully, you'll see the fidelity with which it is chasing that bacteria, right? All the things I told you about moving, it's protruding, it's going engulfing it. All that happens exactly like what I showed which in, in the cartoon that we broke here. But the point being that there is such good fidelity. Wherever the bacteria goes, the white blood cell is following it close on heel. We think this happens because the bacteria has thrown out certain chemicals and the white blood cell knows how that works, right? It's a lot of chemistry over here. What you see is another example of how when embryos form, and I'm just going to pause this video here, and I'm going to tell you a little bit of story before I show you the video. What you're going to show, what you're going to see is uh, when a larva, uh, when, when an egg cell has fused and it's starting to grow into a larva, it needs to make a lot of cells. What also happens in these tiny fruit flies which people study as genetic organisms called a drosophila is you have a zippering action happening. Okay? One side of that hole is getting bridged um, and you'll see that this side needs to merge with this. If you've seen your mother or your sister have a batua, it's just like pulling the two strings of a batua, okay? And you're zipping it, except that it's a seamless, uh, seamless um, bridge that is formed. The question that people are interested in ha understanding is how does, you need tension, remember? In that batua, you must pull. There needs to be tension, otherwise it will not close. So what, and the second question is, if you actually study this closely, you will see that certain cells will get eliminated or die. We don't understand what are the signals that cause these cells a priori to be removed. Is there something about mechanics which contributes to it? Now think about that when you watch this video. And here's the zip and you'll see it is a very seamless merging of the two. Right? I'm going to show you one more time. Right. Now, if this process does not happen properly, the animal will not develop its wings properly. It will not develop properly uh, with a full formed body. So it's a good question. The third question I'm going to show you is work from my lab. Uh, these are how cancer cells migrate. Okay? Remember cancer is not bad because um, you have a lot of growth which happens in certain places. Cancer is bad because certain renegade cells decide to run away and they go and uh, form in other places which is called metastasis. It's the metastasis which is hard to cure. And what you're going to watch here is how breast cancer cells, which are these cells over here, uh, we've plated, all this part is cancer cells and this part is open petri dish. You see these migrate and this guy has suddenly broken away. 
The vidya is not so good, but you'll see that it makes all those protrusions. Um, if we had better contrast, you'd have seen that it goes whoop, 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 and it pushes itself ahead and it migrates. So what about this one cell caused it to break away from the rest of its friends and move away? Could mechanics play a, a role in how they migrate? How fast do they migrate? How does that cell machinery change in causing this kind of movement? Okay, so that those are some of the questions we decided to answer. But the first thing we realized is that we need to have a platform. We need to develop an engineering platform in which we can first get the cells to grow, two is measure how much force it exerts during its migration, and three, can we direct it to go in specific directions. Remember, biology is not isotropic. Biology is not like a, a, I mean, a human body is not like a petri dish. It's got lots of proteins which are present in definite orientations inside the body. So can we now get ourselves to sit on such engineering platforms and study how they migrate? So we developed two experiments. What you're seeing here are tiny pillars. Okay? These are pillars made uh, with, an, with a rubber-like material. These are very short. Um, they're actually, the aspect ratio is pretty good. It's about 2 micron pillar uh, in diameter and about 10 micron in height. To give you an example, one hair on your head is about 70 to 100 micron. Okay? That's how small these pillars are. I like to think of it like Bhishma lying on a bed of uh, arrows in the Mahabharata. Okay? So you have an equivalent situation where the cell is adhered to each of these uh, arrows. And as you pull the arrow, it deflects. If you can measure the deflection, you can tell how much force that cell is exerting at a given point. It's a very elegant way of measuring how these tiny cells exert forces. A second example of how this is done is by getting cells to grow on very soft gels. As soon as you put them on something soft, they'll pull on the substrate. If you can measure how much amount of deformation they have, you can tell how much force the cell is exerting. For example, if you have a thin sheet of plastic bag and you drop hot wax on it, you see it wrinkles very quickly, right? If you can quantify those wrinkles, you have a handle on the elasticity and you can tell how much force that material would have exerted at that location. So those are our two basic ideas of how to quantify forces when cells adhere to substrates. Now to get there was a very difficult task. You'll have a lecture on uh, lithography or nanotechnology or something along this uh, in, as a part of this course. Um, what we do essentially is use nanofabrication, which is how you make your devices that allows you to wear cool gadgets. Essentially, it starts with taking a wafer. It could be a silicon wafer or a glass wafer. We coat it with a polymer. We, uh, we then expose it to, uh, with a mask to ultraviolet. And the regions of which are exposed are the regions which will get cross-linked. You can put different kinds of polymers there. And then you make a pattern by removing the regions which are not cross-linked. You pour the rubber compound which I mentioned on this material. And finally, you get your desired patterns. We have very nice control on the feature size that we can introduce through this technique. We can make pillars in our center, which are about three microns in diameter, extremely repeatable, which is the beauty of how microfabrication works. So my student used this procedure, and what we did was we created a pattern of lines, and alternating with the lines were these little pillars. Okay? Why did we have the lines? Because, I, as I told you, uh, biology is not isotropic. Material is always laid out in specific directions. So to emulate that or to uh, mimic that, we decided to create these lines. We had to put in the pillars because as soon as the pillar deflects, we can tell how much force there is. So 
we had to marry these two ideas together to create this pattern. So this has a certain name of this isotropy and you will see these distributions which tell you how nicely repeatable this is. So these are distance between two pillars, distance between, uh, between two pillars, between two lines and we can create these which are extremely soft materials. And what we next do is we grow cells and this is a cell which is grown just on that rubber compound. Again, the blue color is nucleus and the red color is the actin which I talked about earlier. If you see this on our pattern, you will see that the cell does not have this shape but it's extremely long. Okay? It's extremely long and it's oriented in the direction of these lines. When we started, we didn't have it like this. We just seeded the cells and in some time, about three hours, they orient themselves along the direction of the lines. What, you, what we now did is we put this entire arrangement under a microscope and we watched how these cells run on that substrate. Okay? So it's like giving a racetrack since the Olympics is happening, right? And each cell is running on its racetrack. We didn't plan it that way because if the cells wanted, they could have turned themselves and gone across all those lines. Right? We are not adding any constraints. We are just providing it a substrate and we are seeing what happens. What you see here is cells from the skin which are running. What you see is the white color lines are, uh, are the lines here. The cell body we have outlined it in red and plus is the centroid of that blob. And if you watch these two cells, uh, you see how nicely it follows the line. This was done over a five hour period when uh, the cell chooses to continuously walk along the line. Okay? So something about the substrate is now telling our cell to orient in the direction of lines and two, to crawl in that direction, which is already fun. This cell did a little hop. That's why we have a break. Okay? So we were visualizing it at about 25 frames a second. Um, so the control cells did not have a preferential direction, but as soon as we throw them on this engineered microsubstrate, the cells respond to the substrate and they choose to, di to run in a specific orientation. When we quantify these results, okay, in what is called a rose plot, all the cells seem to go in one direction only. So I've shown the result in four different quadrants. They have not deviated from this slope, which means they're constantly following that line and running in that direction of the line. Um, so this was done over a three hour period. And what we also see is the cell shape and how it changes because as soon as it becomes small, it's generating tension and then it's it's, it's throwing its protrusion out as it gets bigger. So now we are seeing a pattern in how these processes change during cell migrations. Now we didn't get to the fun question which was how much forces do the cells exert when they run? So like I told you, think of this as a little cantilever. If we can measure the deflection of the cantilever, we can quantify how much amount of force there is. So here we've used a computational technique where we have uh, we have said that the base is kept fixed and all the, top, uh, all the top part of the cantilever is being sheared in a specific way. So I'm putting a load like this and pushing it off. Um, we can measure how uh, for a given force how much amount of deflection there is. Remember this is a rubber compound so we cannot use your classic Hooke's law which would be a straight line. What you need is a nonlinear law which shows, like I showed you how rubbers behave, we have to use these nonlinear stress strain relationships to model how much amount of deflection there is. The minute I'm able to construct this, uh, if I were to measure a deflection of one micron, for example, I can already tell how much force that cell is exerting with these kind of models. So how much forces do they exert? What you see here is a picture of a cell which was running on that uh, on that microfabricated pattern. What you see in dark blue are low forces and in red color is where you see high amount of forces. 
you'll also see that we can describe the uh, the differences in forces that the cell exerts along the length of a cell right with such an experiment you'll also see that the forces are typically high in one direction and they're low in the other direction okay because the most likely the cell has extended its protrusion in this direction and to lift off it needs a lot of force so it can de-adhere from the rear end of the cell so this is a very nice way that you can actually measure how much force the cells exert as they walk or migrate in specific directions so this method of measuring tractions um, to quantify the contractility uh, of the cell gives us a handle on deciding the state of a cell okay remember biologists have used lots of metrics to quantify how do you distinguish between different populations of cells uh, and this is the same part that i showed you that we can use cells which are growing on soft polyacrylamide gels here you see there are very high hot spots in regions where the cell has made bonds with its substrate and is pulling on it through springs we can now construct force maps what is complex here is we are giving a displacement and we are trying to ask the question how much force will you measure remember it works normally in the other direction right think you develop strains in material because you're adding a certain load or a certain amount of stress which causes the materials to shear so here we are asking the reverse question we are saying that you have displacements which are provided but now i'm asking the question how much force is being generated in response to this this is called an inverse problem it's very complex to solve these problems in mechanics again it is fun to do it because we now have a handle on how the lines of force could be directed at different regions which have not been done so these were the two different experiments that i showed you okay on how you can measure how much forces cells exert uh, when they adhere but the first question as soon as you see this is why should one care about this force picture is it telling us anything different or is it just cute that you can do these kind of experiments so to show you that it is indeed important this is work from 2006 from a professor in pittsburgh it is now one of the classic uh, works and i'm going to take a minute to describe what this study is what they did was they put a cell on different substrates and this is not just any cell this is a stem cell okay it's a cell which could become any cell it wants to right except that here they put it on substrates which change like in blood or in the brain which is 1 kilopascal all the way to a bone like material which is hundreds of kilopascal right so um they ask the question if i just change the mechanical environment for this cell what really happens to that cell and they looked at this cell at 4 hours 24 hours and 96 hours what they saw was the stem cells which were exactly the same started becoming more brain cell like or neuronal like on soft substrates and they became more like bone cells when they were growing on very stiff substrates this is really changing it's a it's a novel paradigm of how we think biology should work because until now we only grew cells in petri dishes what these people showed for the first time is that you can influence cell behaviors through just a very simple change in the substrate on which that cell is growing so and it also changes the contractility of the cell right which you can quantify with this experiment so he shows that the traction force can be a mechanical signature that you can choose for that cell and it it is it becomes useful for predicting the probability also that a, a cell is more cancer like so now instead of you waiting for several days for your test to come this could have been a very simple way of moving forward 
this is probably what we can think of in terms of diagnosis in, in very nasty diseases like cancers is to decide do you have a cancer like cell there we are still not there our research is at least 10 years behind but perhaps in 10 years we could be thinking of using alternate ways to diagnose cancerous tissues now to go along this direction and since I always have students from mechanical engineering background who are interested in doing fun things we decided to invent a new thing this was a, this was an idea why can't we put cells uh, through a little device and watch what happens to the cells as you put it through shear so this is a device which we have now patented it's very small it sits on top of a microscope stage uh, what's very neat about it is you have a little cone through which you have shearing something okay? and you can expose a petri dish which is kept below here which contains the cells to different kinds of shears what's very clever about this device is that my, my student decided to use a motor from a hard drive which came out so from your old uh, computer hard drives which are just going junk he extracted the motor he fixed it here he controlled it and he could run it at different amounts of speed as soon as you run it in different amounts of speed you can change the shears and now you have a very nice handle on how to vary that shear over an entire range of values this cost us less than 5000 rupees to build if we try and buy commercial instruments they will be huge and it probably costs more than 50 lakh rupees which we can't afford right so this is another way in which you have to be clever in this area okay? you don't always have the resources to do what you want but you have to come up with clever little adaptations on how you can build things that you want to study so this was done in collaboration with my friend Pramod Pularkat who is at the Raman Research Institute and his student Renu now what we want to do with this device what we have shown is that uh, if you measure the number of cells which are attached to the petri dish and you watch it as a function of how much amount of shear that you put on the